Hello, everybody. My name is Michael DeJoya, and welcome to the Dash Trader Newsroom, the last newsroom of the year and the first newsroom of 2023. So glad to be here with you, and thank you for joining us. So let's jump right in. My name is Michael DeJoy. I'm the Director of Educational Services here at Dash Trader, and I'm a licensed professional. And uh, let's jump right in to today's topic, uh, which is, you know, what is the bullish narrative for 2023? Um, has inflation peaked? Uh, will the Fed pivot? Um, will we? Um, will the Fed somehow manage to orchestrate a soft landing for the financial markets and for the world economy? And obviously, we're going to take a look at some of those, um, you know, elements as we're going through the charts. Um, but but certainly, the the narrative has been that inflation peaked somewhere around June, July, and that the Federal Reserve will probably only have to raise rates to about five point two five percent. Currently, they're at around 4.25%. Um, that over the course of the next 12 to 18 months, that inflation will slow and actually get to probably the 2 to 3% level. Um, potentially, the Fed may say that the new normal is 2% inflation, 3% uh, inflation rather than the traditional 2 target, 2% 2 inflationary target. So, needless to say, that is what is uh, is expected from the, the bullish side of things. Certainly, when we look at the charts, I'm going to show you that the NASDAQ has pulled back to the 61.8 retracement level. 61.8 um, is the last level for a bullish retracement. Certainly, that should be good for a bounce in the market. The other key factor that's coming up here in January is uh, the start of earnings season. And this is not just the normal earnings season. This is the year over year, end of year earnings season, um, which is a little bit more significant um, than other earnings season. It's kind of the equivalent of a quick quad witching day on options expiration day versus just the regular quarterly earnings. So um, let's jump into the bearish narrative. The bearish narrative is that the cost of oil will rise again. And uh, there's good reason for the cost of oil to rise. I mean, we've seen record snowfall in places such as Buffalo. Uh, we have seen, um, you know, crazy cold all across the entire eastern seaboard and in some places in the west as well. So it's not unlikely that oil prices will start to rise again. Oil is the prime commodity. As the prime commodity, that means that everything else, so every candy bar, um, can of Coca-Cola that you have in your uh, local bodega or, or shopping mart or 7-Eleven needs to get to where it goes via the price of oil, meaning that truck needs oil to get it there. And obviously, we can also have an EV truck, but there, there's not enough of them to really make an impact yet. But needless to say, you got the idea that the cost of oil will infect prices across the entire country. And this argument is based on the fact that inflation has not yet peaked and that the Fed will have to continue to raise rates all during the course of 2023. And at the rate that the Fed has been increasing rates, you're talking at about 50 basis points, a 50 basis point hike for the next six Fed sessions would take us to around 7.25%. That's a full two points higher than what the Fed said that it was its likely target was going to be, which is around 5.25%. Now, the American economy is still steaming along. We have very, very high employment, although Goldman Sachs just announced that they'll probably be laying off some employees um, you know, this year and, or next year, 2023. Um, but, and you'll probably see a wave of, of layoffs. But even with a wave of layoffs, we're probably going to be somewhere around what is considered traditionally full employment. So we really haven't um, you know, really negatively affected the economy too much just yet, but the, the telling months are going to be January, February, and March. As you have, you know, uh, the, the holiday season, you have statistically high levels of employment around the high uh, the holiday season generally. So once we start to see these earnings numbers come in um, for the holiday season, we're going to get a better sense of the reality of how deep and how bad this recession will be. Now, if you've read our blog and if you've read our newsletter, um, or if you haven't yet, you should certainly go do so. Um, the, the traditional um, definition 
of a recession is two quarters of GDP decline. And we've had that. We've had that really since summertime. So technically, according to the traditional definition, we have been in a recession and you know for the last six months. And now the question is, how deep will the recession go? Now, they say about 70% of the economists out there said there's going to be a recession in 2023. But it's looking like we are already in a recession based on the GDP number. The reason they say that we are not in a recession is because they changed the definition slightly to say that they're looking at a basket of other economic indicators. One of those indicators has been jobs. And the fact is that we are we are still holding in there at around 3.5% unemployment, which is considered full employment. And therefore, they are saying that we are not in a recession because of our jobs number. With all that being said, we're probably in a recession, okay? We're probably, uh, uh, you know, in, in a recession already, or um, we'll have a shallow um, to short-lived recession in 2023. Now, that brings us to the reality between bull and bear. The reality will probably be somewhere in the middle. The truth is usually somewhere in the middle. You have two narratives, one bullish and one bearish. We called the market last year. At the end of last year, the market closed at all-time highs at the end of uh, 2021. And that's exactly what it did right here. If you notice this, I'm going to bring up my little laser pointer here for a moment. But that's exactly what happened. That was the end of 2021. And then, of course, 2022 started and we were down pretty much all year long. So we, we also correctly said that a lot of times that the 70% of the move is in the last 20% of time. And that's also what happened. We had an extended, extended big, big move up that was all driven by Federal Reserve stimulus money and monetary and fiscal policy, fiscal policy being money printed by the U.S. government. And that's part of the argument for the, um, you know, the increase in the new normal of 2% inflation to 3% inflation is, is that it's, you know, with $31 trillion worth of debt, the U.S. federal government kind of has to settle in and accept that they're going to have to print money to pay off old debt. And that's one of the powers that you can do when your currency is the reserve currency of the world. For how long, we don't know, but currently that is the case. So we got to talk about what is, not what we think will happen in the future. Needless to say, the future usually has a few curveballs for us as well. And one of those curveballs just recently was mentioned might be a new variant. You know, cases in China are skyrocketing, even though China is ending its uh, its uh, lockdown, zero tolerance policy. That really, I mean, basically the zero policy, zero tolerance policy hasn't worked. So they're just, OK, you know, throwing in the towel and opening things up. But with that, you're seeing the U.S. requiring PCR tests and all kinds of tests from people coming from China. Um, I think other countries are as well. So you can see that that's possibly a curveball. And there could be one or a hundred other curveballs coming our way. Renewed hostilities or worsened hostilities in, in the Ukraine-Russia war. Now, that can go both ways, right? They could come to a peace settlement in the Ukraine-Russia war. Um, in February, as certainly some people have talked about. Certainly, I, I heard Putin recently saying that he was open to coming to the table. And I even heard Zelensky saying that he was open to coming to the table this coming February. So we can all pray for the best in that conflict, which is going to be about one year old. So the reality is usually somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, obviously, we can all hope and pray that the Fed can orchestrate a soft landing. Certainly, there are some indications of that as time goes on. Um, but there are also some indications that, um, you know, that that inflation might be a little bit more dogged than initially expected. And that would be the trend, as as we all remember. So um, inaccurately called the Federal Reserve called inflation transitory, as did the uh, the Treasury secretary, as did pretty much every other expert. Um, and then certainly we found out that inflation was not transitory. I'm not sure how they could say inflation was transitory when, you know, you're printing $5 trillion, but I'm being a little bit, um, fake, uh, you know, uh, sarcastic about that. I, I just really don't know how anybody could have ever called it as transitory when you're printing that much money. I mean, this is kind of a con economics 101. Needless to say, let us jump to the charts because usually, um, you know, we like to analyze the data. We like to look at the charts. 
and and the charts usually tell us the story. The story is in the charts. So jumping to those charts, I have a couple of um, you know pre-canned charts from our Dash Trader already marked up. And then what I'm going to do is, and this is kind of how we're going to do things uh, kind of on an ongoing basis going forward, is I'm going to take a look at some of the long-term charts on my Dash Trader using some of the analytics tool and kind of teaching the software as I go. And um, so here we go. This is, um, you know, the COVID pandemic sell-off. So here we can see the COVID pandemic sell-off. Then we got this massive, massive rally, like, I mean, almost unbelievable rally, but that's what happens when you dump, you know, $5 trillion into the market in the United States and probably about 2 trillion euros in Europe. Um, but needless to say, you can see that massive rally as tech stocks really boomed. This is, um, this is the, this is the S&P. So this was not the tech uh, index, but certainly there's some tech stocks on there as well. You can see that we've had a, a drawback pull down. Okay. There's, there are, um, you know, probably about a 30 to 40% pull down. Um, you could see the trend line. So that was the first break of the trend line on the uptrend. That was right at the beginning of, of 2022. We, rallied off that trend line we broke down again in the summertime we you know kind of rallied a little bit you know had a mid-summer rally then we sold off once again we had another little rally recently and then of course now we, we are kind of sitting here at support which would be an ideal place for us to rally the question is if we don't rally and we fail where do we go we go down here to the point of control the red line indicated here on our chart is the point of control the purple line is the high of the pre-pandemic. So that was the high before the pandemic. So, you know, here we've had a, you know, really global catastrophe due to government stimulus and government intervention um, and federal, federal reserve or, you know, central bank intervention. We've had this massive printing of money, really massive creation of indebtedness, which is really not a natural state, but, but needless to say, we've kind of come, gotten used to it. Um, and then, of course, we have this pullback thereafter. And, you know, now we're showing some signs of bottoming. Now, certainly, if we do rally up, we could probably just chop around. If you look here on our Fibonacci retracement levels, you can see that there's certainly a level here where we could just chop around between the high of the pre-pandemic and, of course, this kind of most recent high um, in this area here. That would be an ideal place for us to kind of chop, chop around and go sideways. A sideways move is called a correction in time. A correction in time would be healthy. All right, so let's jump in here. So now this is the QQQ. And then this one, um, you know, I used our Dash Traders Fibonacci retracement analysis tool. And um, you can see here that the last chance for a bullish rally is at 61.8%. And we have a little double bottom here. And of course, today, we today, which is the 29th, you know, this probably won't be viewed until the 30th or maybe even next week on the 3rd or the 4th. Um, bottom, double bottom, you know, NASDAQ represents NASDAQ 100 tech stocks, it's a retracement level. This is the last chance for the NASDAQ to kind of orchestrate a rally. Now, if we break these lows, you know, look out below, we're going to the pre-pandemic high, right? So that, that would be kind of dismal. We rally up here, okay? We can rally up off these lows. We should probably take out, it would be bullish for us to take out the midpoint of the W. We would want to see that. That would actually show us, that would support the bullish story. Um, if we don't take out that level, we would probably lead to a sell-off and then another measured move down, which would kind of make this mountain of the pandemic that would be the pandemic mountain, I, I would call it. I'd probably call it the uh, Mount Everest of the pandemic, COVID mountain. Um, but you can see the, the the pattern here that this is just like a bubble created by, you know, U.S. federal government, European Central Bank, and Federal Reserve intervention. Now, this um, is uh, Apple, and um, certainly key support for Apple is at the 50% retracement level, which would be right here. This is Apple. Um, Apple is, um, you know, a key stock in the market. It's, you know, we say so goes Apple, so goes the market. Apple led the market up. You could see Apple, this little, this was the pandemic sell-off. Apple broke through those levels first and led the market all the way up. 
Certainly, if the market's going to go down, Apple's going to be the one that leads the market down. Um, my guess is Apple's going to snap back to the point of control, um, which you can see here indicated in red. Point of control will be at 150. That's the stock, uh, the level that Apple has been gravitating back to. If it does not pull up to 150 and it goes to any level below that, expect a secondary breakdown on Apple, and that would lead the markets down. So we continue to watch Apple, and we continue to watch Tesla. Now, this is Tesla on the uh, on the weekly chart. Um, so Tesla um, even broke the 61.8 Fib level. This supports the bearish arguments. And Tesla is not nearly as important to the market as Apple, but Tesla basically is in free fall. Now, it has stopped here at this level, and it's overdue for a bounce. Um, you know, it didn't get quite to 100, but I think in the pre-market, it was down at around 105. Needless to say, Tesla has been the other stock, like Apple, that has been pretty much leading the markets over the past couple of months. All right, so let's go to our Dash Trader to, um, to take a further look at some of the charts. And I'm going to look at some things like oil, I'm going to look at gold, and obviously these things are helpful for us to look at. Um, let's just see something here. Okay, these are all things that are helpful for us to look at. I am going to bring my DAS trader on here. Let's make sure that we can see this. All right, so we should be seeing our um, screen share. Let's make sure I can see everything. I'm just going to try my screen share once again. Okay, perfect. So, so here we have my dash trade, and I'm just going to go right here to the charts. I'm going to make make my charts a little bigger, and I'm going to make this maximize this to the size of the screen. And I'm going to take a look at, you know, USO. So here is USO. Uh, I'm going to put it on the weekly chart. So here's the price of oil. You can see the bottom and the double bottom on the weekly. Now we have hit into a little bit of um, a little bit of resistance on the weekly. But this would be called like a, it's almost a near perfect setup for a one, two, three continuation for oil to go back up to the 74 level on the USO. I'm going to bring up the USL. Just to confirm that, USL is a longer-term contract. It, it uses futures contracts for each of the um, upcoming 12 months. And the USL says that we're probably going to get to around 37, 38. If I bring up the OIL contract, um, which is the ETN for oil, that says we're going to get to about 33. So every one of these charts is confirming that the price of oil is most likely going to go up, which supports the bearish argument, the, the bearish narrative. narrative. That doesn't mean it's going to go up a lot. It just means it's going to go up a little bit to the next resistance level. And that, obviously, things can always change. But in the next one, two to three weeks, we're probably going to see an increase in the price of oil. That's fairly safe to say. Now, let's let's just go a little bit deeper. Let's go into our daily chart. And you can see, yes, price is above the moving averages. Um, we can even go in a, a little bit deeper and go into our load settings. I'm going to go bring up my CCI MACD. All right, so boom, CCI MACD. MACD is running positively. CCI is slightly oversold, uh, overbought. So that might pull back a little bit on the short term. But but overall, we're seeing the MACD is looking positive, And the CCI is also confirming that as well. CCI is uh, saying short-term sell-off. MACD is confirming the, the current trend. Um, let me just do this. Chart area. Move area because I want it a little bit bigger. So here's our MACD. We're going to leave that on there. Let's put up our weekly chart. Weekly chart, MACD is just turning. So what that says to me is that when the green signal line crosses over the red signal line and the MACD histogram has been bearish. Now, I want you to notice the histogram was negative and now it's less negative. So what that says to me is that we have a double bottom and a possible higher low. So this is kind of a long-term trend increase on the weekly. So the trend for the price of oil is probably going to go higher longer term. Let's take a look at gold. We call gold the old man. The old man has made a tremendous run up. 
Okay, on the weekly, the trend on the on the MACD is also positive. Let's take a look at the shorter term chart. Gold is trending up. So gold is also showing signs of strength. So gold is also saying that more than likely, you know, the health of some of the world economies are not quite as uh, as good. So gold tends to be a hedge of um, fiat currencies. It's a traditional hedge of fiat currencies. We could go to the new hedge, GBTC. I mean, there's really not much of a bigger dog than the uh, cryptocurrency market, Bitcoin, Ethereum, ETHE. I mean, these are real dogs. I don't think that these will be coming back anytime soon. But the gold, the gold, the old man, certainly looking good. I'd call that an ascending pennant or an ascending triangle. So that to me indicates that the price of gold is going higher, probably not indicating a good set of patterns for the world economy going forward. Um, let's just pop around and take a look at a couple of other tech stocks like Microsoft. Microsoft had a really good pop today, but um, overall, uh, you know, Microsoft looks like the market. It's probably ready for a pop. I mean, the market has sold off quite considerably. And uh, I'm just going to show what this looks like if I, let's see, going to hit data config. So if you want on your Dash Trader, you can always go back a couple of years. So this has made that a long-term chart. Of Microsoft. So like, let's say I wanted to bring on my FIB tool, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and that's what I'm also going to be doing. So hopefully, if you are interested in always learning how to use your charts on Dash Trader a little bit better, what you might want to do is tune in here on a weekly basis um, to uh, to kind of learn how to use some of these awesome charting tools. So this is the from the pandemic low. Um, Microsoft, boom, he's in right there at 61.8 on our Fibonacci retracement levels. We are currently at the 50% retracement line. So this is, again, indicating and supporting the bullish argument that technology might be ready to bounce a little bit. I'm um, going to bring up one more um, somewhat random stock. Look up Visa. Visa and MasterCard. Certainly on a recovery. I mean, they're not really going down. You know, it's kind of holding their own, kind of a little bit of a bullish buy set up here. You know, MACD line looking good as well. Maybe a little bit of a swing up. So, I mean, Visa and MasterCard are kind of a good indicator for, you know, consumer spending, how strong the consumer is. Of course, that can change on a dime. But looking at this chart, it's not a terrible chart. And I just brought up MasterCard as well. I'm not going to beleaguer this too, too much. Um, overall, I think that the truth is probably somewhere in the middle that we're probably um, kind of not at the worst of it yet, but we're probably on ready for a little bit of a bullish bounce um, on the technology sector specifically. Um, I do want to bring up the Dow because the Dow is interesting. Um, you look at the Dow and you, when you go into the Dow, it's not nearly as bad as the nasdaq right so the dow certainly has held up well dia look at the qqq right qqq looking pretty dismal dia not looking so bad at all so industrial stocks um have really held up well uh in relation to the nasdaq nasdaq led the tech bubble it also let it down Whereas the Dow and those blue chip companies did exactly what they're supposed to and held on to value pretty, pretty well. All right. On that note, I'm going to switch back to my my uh, my slideshow. And let's get this show back on the road. All right, stay up to date on all things DAS um, by signing up to our monthly newsletter and email. Simply fill out um, the form at the bottom of our webpage, uh, www.dastrader. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Dash Trader TV. Now, there is some other announcement I wanted to mention. We have a new number one best trader competition starting at the end of January, sponsored by Cobra Trading. Um, it's going to be a day trading competition, so stay tuned and get ready to sign up and to try your luck at becoming the number one best trader on the next number one best trader uh, competition. Follow us on social media at Das Trader, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. All right, see you all next year at the State of the Market special event, and certainly see you in the next newsroom. Thank you very much for joining me. Michael DeJoya signing off.